I believe that we all are here on this planet to find like harmony in our pain and find sacred power in our pain. And so the only way to really do that is to understand and love every part of us and to no longer fragment or reject or hide the trauma, which would also be known as the shadow. There's no magic bullet. Like whatever the work is that you're studying, I think it's a powerful question of like, how are you sitting with that, integrating that, drinking that in, practicing that, you know, putting on a new like suit there. It's about your capacity to hold space for the magic. And if you are like, like how wide can you hold space for that? Janice Rasa, welcome back to the Soul Seeker podcast. It feels like it's been a couple of years, but this is your third appearance and that might be the most for anyone on this pod. I'm not sure. (laughs) So thank you so much for being here. It's been some time since we've had you. I've been working with you since probably like 2018 or 19. And now I'm in your private group, which I'm so stoked about. You spoke to my private group, just it's so much synergy. I love it. For people that haven't met you before, I know it's a loaded question and it's a big question, but what's kind of like your elevator pitch if you were just to meet them in the elevator and had to explain who you are and what is it that you do? Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Sam. First off, thanks for having me back. I mean, I love our connection. I love that, you know, our lines crossing in this life and I'm super grateful to be back, honored to be back a third time, feeling really excited today and to see what's going to come through. So, you know, if I meet somebody and they don't know about the Akashic Record, I basically tell them like this. The Akashic Field is a divine library or like Google that we can access to really see information about your soul, about the soul of lands and institutions, organizations, and the history of that beyond this time and space, beyond the dimensions and past lifetimes. So we can access someone's Akasha and look at deeper patterns to help them make sense of the world that's happening right now. So the work I do is about helping people access that point through the Akashic field. I'm also a licensed therapist. And I find it just gets to the heart of the matter like right away and really calls forward the patterns that are within people that are sometimes unnamed, but felt. So it's a really cool way to do shadow work. That's amazing. Yeah, it's been so useful for me. And before we get into more with the Akashic Records, I just want to pull at the word and terminology of shadow work, because that's something that's come up with a friend recently. And I would love to hear from you what shadow work means to you. Yeah, so I think about shadow work, you know, through like Debbie Ford has done a lot of work on this as well. And it's like this idea that there are aspects of ourselves unclaimed like the underbelly of a whale, and they sort of live in the dark, yet they're part of us and fragmented. And to ignore shadow work might happen unconsciously because there's some shame or trauma associated with that. And so we exist in our world here in the light. And, you know, it just takes a matter of time. There'll be like a trigger or relationship thing. And then the shadow, so to speak, pops forward. So what that really means is like, the unclaimed parts of you, like maybe you don't like people knowing that you're selfish or maybe you don't want people to know you have a certain fear and security. That stuff comes out as projections in your world and make attractions from that place. So shadow work is about owning your shadow. It's about loving your shadow. It's about integrating or alchemizing your shadow. It's not about shaming it or make fixing it. I mean, I believe that we all are here on this planet to find like harmony in our pain and find sacred power in our pain. And so the only way to really do that is to understand and love every part of us and to no longer fragment or reject or hide the trauma, which would also be known as the shadow. Beautiful. Now, a follow-up question to that. Would you say that doing the inner work is mutually exclusive with shadow work like where how do we relate the two because this was a conversation i was having with a friend Mm -hmm. recently and she mentioned that for all the work that she's done she doesn't feel like she does shadow work and you know me well enough and listeners some of you may be new but i mean the podcast is called soul seeker right so use your imagination it's about doing inner work right (laughs) to me like really going within 
is shadow work is what where would you say it differentiates between like inner work and shadow work yeah i guess these are like semantics but what i would say is like you know what's your access point in the deep ocean you know like shadow work is about going all the way to that space i don't know that whatever depth you're in if it's no longer shadow work i don't know if i would tease that out I think it's all helpful in owning our stuff, but I, I don't know that I'd separate them. I'd just say there are certain practices, probably certain self-work practices that take you deeper than others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That's kind of the way I think about it. Like shadow work, like inner work being like the umbrella, right? And shadow yeah. work, like being under it. And I think it, what I'm hearing from you is like, we could do the simple things like meditate 20 minutes a day or whatever and do all the maintenance stuff. It's great. Mm -hmm. It's inner work and everything, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going as deep as doing like shadow work. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It's about like, Hey, what parts of you? And there's just a juicy shadow work question, right? Like what parts of yourself would you be really embarrassed and ashamed for people to know? Mm. Like, that's a great question that will take you to that space within yourself. Mine is my low testosterone. Man, that is something that has just been plaguing me. And that is yeah. absolutely, absolutely something that I've been working on for a few years. And, you know, it, it's interesting because last week at the time of this recording, we had our first call with your group. And yeah. I think it's fine that I'm sharing this because it's my experience and it's nothing. Yeah. Not, it's fine to share, but the guides came through and they mentioned like, you know, me and my vulnerability and mm. it, you know, how I could be more vulnerable. And I'm like, man, that's interesting because yeah, I'm not afraid to talk about this stuff publicly, but when it's time to talk with say like a partner or a close friend or like go really deep about something uncomfortable and fully be vulnerable, I do challenge. I, I am challenged with that for sure. Yeah. I think there's something there. And I think the curiosity of like, What's that about for me? And being able to sit in discomfort with those questions are like really the work itself. I mean, I feel like in order for us to be holding space in the work that we do, we have to be uh, honest about the work in ourselves. I find like we teach most that we need to learn. I say that about myself and I know that my own shadow work lies in like dealing and healing like some family karma and in some perspective that I have about myself, like being a selfish person or, you know, not, not, yeah, not being enough, needing to work harder, doing something wrong. I mean, we all have these beliefs and we see them kind of as buzzwords, like buzzwords on social media, like love yourself, like all the things, you know, but like, it's very different to see it outside quite another to like reflect on a question on like, how am I connected to that? And what are the ways in my life in which that shows up? And to speak into that space in uncomfortable like circles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that definitely resonates. And another thing, yeah, I'm going to not go there. There's another thing that kind of came up and I'm like, no, that's not important. So moving on from that, thank you for okay. that little rabbit hole. We'll get back to the Akashic Records. Yep. This is an amazing place, you know, if you can call it that. And sometimes, you know, I'll ha I'll be talking to people and they'll talk about the Kasha field. And w just real quick as well, I, sh I should probably know this, but what's the difference in terms of using the terminology like or, or the word Akashic versus Akasha? Yeah, they're just like different iterations of the same word, like Akashic readings would be like readings or channeled work that would be specifically from the source of the Akashic record. I refer to the Akasha as the energy itself. Akashic it. reading is like the reading that comes from the Akasha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, I think we've gone over that in the past. Yeah. That resonates. Yeah. So in terms of all the work that you're doing, I know you're passionate about a lot of different things, but one of the things we were talking about before we hit record was kind of navigating this human experience as a spiritual person and while still staying grounded in the 3D and, and maintaining that spiritual connection, something I call soul life balance, right? So mm -hmm. what comes up for you in terms of navigating this human experience and not getting lost in the ethers and also not getting lost in all the trials and t tribulations and obligations of the human experience? 
Yeah. I mean, this is such a juicy question. It's like an ongoing question for me and I think the folks I work with. And it's this like idea of like, we aren't here to live in polarity anymore. You know, I feel like that's part of the spiritual awakening on the planet. Like we're here to practice integration. And, you know, I think like there's, it's very easy to spiritually bypass, right? Mm -hmm. Love and light to all. This, none of this matters, this human suit, you know, right? Like, get me out of this body. When can I go home to my star people? And I feel like I say this because I've been there at various seasons of my life, you know, like throw it all into that bag and, and connect because that feels good. But like we forget that if we weren't, it, you know, like we're in a body for a reason, right? Like we're not wherever we want to be right now. We are in this form manifesting. We may also be in those other realms, but we are experiencing consciousness in third dimension, which means that there is integration and alchemy wanted, you know, for our soul experience. And so if you fragment and spiritually bypass, then you aren't integrating the work. Right. Like, this is why I always say to folks, like, if they go to like healers and stuff, I'm always kind of curious, like, what integration work is happening? I know you do integration work with plant medicine, but like, we have to bring it into the form. Right. No one can like fix you. Right. There's no magic bullet. Like, whatever the work is that you're studying, I think is a powerful question of like, how are you sitting with that, integrating that, drinking that in, practicing that, you know, putting on a new like suit there. Then conversely, there's a danger of like being totally immersed in the third dimensional experience as mm -hmm. well, right? Which is like victim saturation or hierarchy or like obsession with materialism and and the realities of 3D, which is like all about like, you know, status or money or what people are doing around us and our desire to control that. And I think in that space, like life can feel really heavy. Life can be like the universe is out to get you. And I find folks really cut off spiritually when we're living in that space. So really like the juicy part is how do you do the dance, right? Well, I think about it like like an infinity symbol. So it's like sort of sliding in and like scooping in the spiritual practice while remembering what it's like to be in a human body. And I like have lots to say about that because I'm sure your question is like, how do you do that? Well, I feel like like we can go there today. But the goal, I think consciously, which is a good goal for all of us, is like, am I in the dance or am I attaching to escapism in some way, right? Am I, am I both in the human experience feeling what is meant for me to feel and as evidence for where I am and what wants transmutation? And am I checking in with what this, the purpose of this may be in my life? So, I mean, I think Th those questions are good starts and we want to like have that mindset like am i embodying and feeling am i connecting to a larger why here you know victor frankel man search for meaning man can endure almost any how if he has an understanding of a larger why so i think his work in love therapy is like really the cornerstone of the work i do along with buddhism which is like we have to make the connection of suffering in 3d to some like larger why and we have to do that dance I mean, we can talk more about how, but like, I feel like that's like a good start is to really ask those questions. Yeah, absolutely. And that is one of the harder things to find that why. I mean, that's why Simon Sinek was able to build his platform of starting with why and finding your why and all that type of stuff. And yeah. one thing that I, I'd be surprised if you and I haven't chatted about, but maybe not since it's been a bit. Um, but there's such a massive narrative in society, but also specifically in spiritual circles about finding your mission, your purpose, or even your dharma. And yeah. one day I had this download come through that was like, how ironic. And it, it, like, it's a big, it's, it's shocking to me that there are things in spiritual circles that keep people in a limited state and they don't realize it. And that's exactly what's going on with this needy pressure of finding your purpose, your mission, or your dharma. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, what if it, you believe that quantum physics is real and that the outer world you experience with your five senses is a reflection of your inner world? Well, if you have this needy energy of create, needing to find your purpose, mission, or dharma, Think about how that's going to affect and manifest into your physical form, right? And I really believe that it all comes down to self-love because at the end of the day, 
so much of the conditioning and programming of society is to outsource our happiness, like you said, with things like materialism or whatever it else is. So curious in terms of like anchoring into your why, kind of like what you're talking about, like what are we supposed to do if someone's listening that is like, oh yeah, that resonates with me. I never thought about it like that. Yeah. Well, is my, what does that mean my why is? Like what comes up for you there? Yeah, I mean, I think the Akasha and I, I have the Akasha open now and they kind of say like we overcomplicate our mission and purpose all the time, right? Like we teach sort of tinker with that in ways where we think it's connected to work always and it's not like necessarily and i think you're asking like two sort of different questions but like what i hear from the akashic field now is like we all have one purpose and it's super simple it's to come to this planet right and it's to experience ourselves in its current dimensional place through our relationships and experiences and as we do that we purify and engage in teaching and expand, right? We're here to find unconditional love, neutrality, and acceptance, mostly with ourselves and with all people and patterns around us. That's really the simple definition. We come here to find unconditional love and acceptance, mostly with ourselves and with all people and conditions around us. And so we come here and we like bump into walls and people and relationships and issues and life areas that challenge that goal. That's really what we're here to do. But the why in context to a certain pain point or trauma in your life, mm -hmm. I think is about seeing it from like, okay, I'm here to find love and peace and connection and neutrality with this issue. What do I need to do or what do I need to download that brings me closer to unconditional love, acceptance, neutrality in this situation? This example, we might attach to certain relationship patterns over and over and over, abusive relationship patterns, relationship patterns where they might be void of emotional connection. We might take jobs we hate for money and do that over and over again. They're like, oh, why, does, why do I have all these jobs I hate? Well, if we don't ask the question, like, what choice here takes you closer to unconditional love and acceptance for yourself? The answer is clear. Leave the bad relationship or job. <laughs> but we often don't ask about that larger why. We're like, how can I make it work? And what tends to show up there is trauma, trauma memory, karmic trauma, replaying itself. The soul always does what it's familiar with. It doesn't really love to do what's uncomfortable. However, when you're doing shadow work and you're having tough conversations, you're like trying that on. You're, you're trying on the discomfort and you have a, like a larger chance of being more conscious about employing like strategy in your life. That's uncomfortable, right? Like I've done, I've done a ton of discomfort. In fact, I use discomfort now as a meter for like, am, I'm on the right, the right path of that my soul wants, right? Because I'm pushing the boundaries a little bit. Yeah, discomfort's where the growth happens. And I'm, right. I'm curious what some of your discomfort practices look like. Recently, I've done a, a little challenge of daily cold plunging in the ocean. And that's been incredible. And, you know, I'm not someone who typically would be the first to say like, oh, let's, let's go do a cold plunge. But even an ice bath, which is a more intense version of that, like I yeah. always notice after I do an ice bath, how much better I feel afterwards. But what are some of your discomfort practices uh, as of late? Yeah, this is a good question. I find like I like a lot of my like karmic stuff is is in like family, right? So I have Chiron, if there's the astrology people out there in the fourth house of family. Chiron's a wounded healer. Teach me, you know, what you need to learn, but really wounded in that space. And I have this like dynamic, amazing, like Viking little seven-year-old who like pushes all of my buttons, right? Is like, remember when you were three and you said this horrible thing to when I was three, you said this horrible thing to me. And I'm like, oh God, did I, did I do that? You know? And so like, he like is a mirror of like, hey, you could be messing it up. You could be screwing up your family. Like, and, and I'm constantly like sitting in these uncomfortable places of like personal accountability and like striving to accept myself as I am and not what maybe other people think I should be as a mom and certainly like not taking to heart some of the things my very flippant you know, son would say, 
But it is hard work to sit in that discomfort and to be intentional and show up in a way where like, this is not normal to me. This is not comfortable to me, but I'm going to do it. Right. Like he's like all into rough and tumble. And I'm like, I have the sensory earplugs because I can't even handle like the sound of pots and pans and people in a grocery store. He's like, let's go outside and you do firecrackers, you know? And I'm like, oh, uh-huh. he's like, okay, we're doing it, you know? And so like it, for me, it just feels like my skin is crawling to be in these situations where I have to really measure like, like what is best for this relationship with this child and what does he need? And negotiating often like, what do I need to be the best mother? And I think both of us are very different. And like, it's, it's going to be a lifelong negotiation. But like my spiritual discomfort and my astro- astrology is really like how I navigate those deep relationships and and find the dance of balance there. Because I won't survive if I'm always doing what everybody else in my family you know, wants me to be. And luckily I have a great supportive partner. He's like, you do you. Thank God that that part of my life is really well. But my son is really is challenging. I'll probably hear this one day. I love you, Kai. You're my greatest teacher. And I bow to your greatness. Yeah, but but it's tough. It's tough for me. I feel like he's he's here to make me a greater, sh- shinier expression of of myself. And I think that if we saw all relationships that were tough like that, you know, I think we would experience them differently. We wouldn't project and the ego and the wounds. Like, I know my stuff. You know, I yell, I yell. And then sometimes, right. So this is also like another 3D thing. Like, oh, Candace, yeah, people laugh about this. They're like, you are, you must give so much light and love. It must be amazing to <laughs> for your son to have you as a mother. <laughs> and I'm like, Mm, I don't think he would say that. Although if I said that to him out loud, he would say, oh, no, of course, mommy, I love you. But like, they're like, you must never get angry. I have Mars in the first house next to my moon. Like, I'm the most angry person I know, right? That's why I do this work. Because like, I am working with the energy of management of emotion. Like, you'll never hear me say anywhere that someone, that any emotion is on a desire. Like, it's a reflection of who you are and your legacy and like, this is another great example of my uncomfortable spaces. But like when I when I can't contr- contain the energy, sometimes I'll yell like my, she yells. Right. And then I like remember, like, what is true for me here? What's the work? What's the, what does the ego not want to do? The ego doesn't want to own up to a mistake. The ego doesn't want to see me as imperfect as a spiritual, I don't know, student or teacher, whatever I am in the world. But what is right and important for my soul and in the balance of unconditional love for myself and my son is to is to di- is to engage him in a dynamic way and apologize. And I've ap- I apologize to him all the time. And I'm like really clear, like, however, I showed up in that moment. I was not about you. It was about me. Right. And then even after I have to make sense of the deep criticism that I still hold for that. Right. Like, why can't I get it right? And, you know, my husband's like, yeah, you got Mars in the first half. You got Mars next to your moon. Like this is who you are, the passion and the and the grit and the courage and like the fortitude that you are in the world and your confidence, like that is also related to that. But it's going to be over here too, right? This goes back to the shadow. There's a light aspect to this quality and there's a shadow aspect. So we got to make peace with this stuff, right? You got to make peace with it or, or, or it consumes you. So, I mean, my shadow work, my uncomfortable work, is accepting myself as I am and allowing that to be really imperfect in my personal relationships. That was a long, very intimate story, but it's the truth. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that absolutely is an intimate story. And I appreciate your your vulnerability in showing the behind the scenes because it's it's e- even as well as I know you too. Like that that was surprising for me to hear a lot of that. So it's really helpful because, you know, as you know, I've recently gotten into a relationship with the amazing woman shout out to you, Jamie McFadden and her daughter, Sophia. And I am getting a crash course now that we live together of like parenting. And it is a, a challenge, you know, and I know you and your husband, Brian, I believe it's something mm-hmm. similar where you both work from home. You're both in the healing space and same with Jamie and I, we both mm-hmm. work from home and is so much to manage just our own schedules and energies. Yeah. And then along with the children. And I mean, we have one kid, you have two, we have two kids if you include my dog, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Would love to hear how you navigate parenthood, like on besides the contract with your son and all that, like just yeah. navigating parenthood and like being a business person at home, you know? Yeah. 
Well, I think first, if, if you can't talk about this without saying like, there's clearly still a social norm that women need to be like maternal and nurturing. And I think that's dying in a lot of ways or evolving, we'll say evolving. But that like does weigh on me in terms of like what I should be doing or expecting. Mm. And that's part of my own journey in balance. And I just want to say like, shout out to like, the women or or the men who are like carrying a lot of that, that pressure, you know, to show up. And I, I know that I experience that a lot. I think some of the ways that we do it with grace is that I'm grateful that my partner and I have like really conscious dialogue over our true assets and strengths and conversely, like where we struggle. And so we have some transparent conversation around that because I'm good at like managing logistics and taking care of a bunch of things at one time. Whereas like anything very sensory high, I like don't do well. And so it's like, if there's a screaming child, you know, Brian knows like he'll come in and be like, pinch hit, you know, like, do you got this or do you need me here? And I'm like, I need you, you know, cause I can like, I can feel like psychically all of the energy that the, my child, my children experience. So it's very overwhelming to my, it's very flooding to my nervous system. So we, we do it that way. You know, it's it's imperfect. There's a lot of like discussion of like what we need also, what we need permission for. I think that's a powerful question. Couples like, what do you need more permission for? What do you need more permission for? How can I support you here in that space? So we do it. We don't have a lot of family locally, so it makes it really hard. Like it's on us to make it work. And I, you know, I, I I've been intentional about my values. Like I have a value to show my children that like it's you can be a powerful like woman in the world and you can, I can do that in my 10th house in the area of work. And, and I'm intentional though, that when I'm with them, I'm with them. I think that's another thing is like, you can't, like, I can't hold space mentally, energetically to do it all at the same time together. You know, like when I'm at work, I'm present and I try to really stay in that moment. So a lot of my Buddhist practices are really useful when I'm with my children, like I don't check email and I don't like try to, you know, double time. I'm just trying to be present for them because you know, children don't need perfect parents. They need present parents, you know? And so like, I continue to remind myself of that when I'm with them, I can make mistakes, but I'm present with the needs and I'm present with their like, with attention for them. And so that's what I do. I'm sure that's not, I mean, I'm a, I'm a minority in a lot of the groups that I'm in, of uh, women who are stay-at-home moms and such like that. So I always feel a little bit different, but I like remind myself, like I'm here to, to be able to do both, to be able to be a present parent and to fulfill my dream and Rasa healing. And I think like shout out to the dads who are also, you know, holding space for that as well, because the gender roles are, are definitely shifting, but it's, it's not easy. Conscious dialogue is, I think is, is really critical though. Conscious dialogue. Absolutely. And it's not easy, you know, with us, she goes to school nine to two, or uh, your kids or what's your daughter's name again? Her name is Ren, like the bird. Yeah. That's right. And she's like two or something. It's going to be two next month. So yeah, she's, she goes to like a little preschool, like three hours, three days a week. So we get like a little window in the morning. Right. So that's the thing that's tricky because there's, you know, with Jamie and I, we're trying to like jam everything in, into this tiny little window and they get home from school. And then, you know, it's like, okay, there's other activities, take them here, there. And then, you know, we're trying to get our stuff done still because that's a small window. And uh, the last thing either of us wants to do is sit her in front of a screen, you know, and sometimes you just got to do that because there's no other option, unfortunately. And then the last thing on this is time for her and I, right? Because oh it's yes. a family dynamic. So I would love to hear anything that comes up for you on this topic. Yeah, I feel like if you're not intentional with the relationship, it takes a back seat, mm -hmm. you know, because like the needs of like children, the needs of the home, they just show up, you know? Like I made that, you know, I shared on social media, like the dog still throws up on my carpet, whether I'm meditating every day or praying for world peace. Like when the dog goes up on my carpet, like I got to take care of that. You know, when the, the baby poops her pants, I got to take care of that. I can't be like, Brian, let's make out, you know, and talk about our dreams. Like I have to, right? Children are like, feed me, feed me. So like yeah. just life shows up. I think like we, what we've tried to do is more recently because we've had, it was easier with one, you know, but it just like life becomes complicated is that we, we have a, we schedule a date night, like one-on-one, -on -one, like 
at least like it sounds like terrible to say out loud. It's like only once a month. But we also have we pull cards together, oracle cards several times a week. And we make a, a, a point to sit down every night at the dinner table. The children are there. But we play this card game where it's that you ask like self-reflective questions and everybody has to answer the question. So like I, I try to be really intentional with that, where when he's answering his question or I'm answering mine, I'm like making eye contact. I'm like I'm with you. I'm hearing your answer. So it's like these little ways that we tie, we tie energy in, but especially because we work for ourselves, we, we work opposite schedules a lot of times. So we have to be really intentional about the quality time. And I think we show up very differently when we're alone than when we show up with our children. There's like silly dad, mystical hippie mom, keep it moving, do fun stuff. But when we're with together outside of family, it's more like playful, flirty, deep philosophical conversation and conspiracy theories. (laughs) And we just like live in that space. And it's like, oh, yeah, I remember that part of me. I remember that part of you. Right. Like we can't talk about conspiracy theories with our son. You know, he's too young for that. So those parts of us sort of stay, stay hidden. And it's nice to make sure you allow all versions of yourself forward that attracted you to that person in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. There's something I want to pull out there and now yeah. I forgot pull it. it. Uh, let me, let me see if it's going to come back to me. Nope. It didn't come back to me. <laughs> Maybe it will a little bit later. Is, is there anything that the guides want to chime in about with this? Because we, you and I, all of us parents out there, or I'm going to include myself and step yeah. into that. We could use all the help we can get, right? Yeah. I mean, I, what I hear the Akash is saying is like our spiritual ascension and growth is attained through our interactions and relationship and specifically what shows up within you that's in the way of unconditional love. And we wouldn't know that unless we were in close proximity vulnerably with someone else, Mm -hmm. like with my son, for example, right? My husband is very complimentary. It's not like really karmic there. It's sort of feels very easeful. So I don't experience that with him. And so I've known parts of myself that I didn't know until I had the chance to be in close proximity. So the Akasha says, sometimes we work really hard. And this goes back to that that spiritual practice versus 3D experience, like I don't have to work really hard to spiritually attain something. I just have to show up in a relationship that's 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 electric in the most conscious version of myself or the most loving version of myself and really explore that because that is the spiritual practice. So I feel like the tips around how to navigate that is don't just endure that. And then throw it in a box and go do your spiritual practice over in left field. Feel like your spiritual practice is happening real time, like in the field, in your life, in your relationships. So whatever you're learning, and I find this to be true in the Akasha, whatever you're picking up or learning over here tends to find its way into your life. And if we're conscious, meaning we're having like real honest dialogue about it, you'll see it showing up like, oh. This is a season of my life where I need to practice more tolerance. I need to practice more vulnerability to like use your word. And so you don't have to look far, I guess, is what the Akasha is saying. The spiritual work is in the present moment in your relationships. How can we slow down as a family unit? I find that what is helpful is to put relationship connection as a priority over the individual, the individual's need. So like our family relationship, our family connection is, has a priority in our lives. And we, 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 we create that by having rituals or family outings or like things we do consistently that say, Hey, as a family, we do this. We do like Sunday cleaning. We turn the music on. Everyone cleans. My son gripes every time. We're like, it's cleaning. You know, and it's like a family ritual that we do that. And so we get to bond, you know, he does the dishes with us. And it's like, yeah, like the magic is in the dishes. The the magic is in the dishes where like y- you connect. And so, for example, it's very easy for us in our family where I'm like coming out of a, of a session and I'm super ungrounded and baby's like trying to go to bed and Brian's putting her to bed. And then my son is drawing some or building some elaborate thing and everybody's in their own world. You know, and I think that's common 
And we see that in our families. So we're like, we have to be intentional about the needs of the group being just as important, probably not more important, but just as important as the needs of the individual in the group. And so we do that through some of our ritual activities like family cleaning, but also like moon ritual, mm. you know, moon rituals. Yeah. We do those in our house. And my children, my, my daughter has no clue what's going on. She, she just bangs a singing bell and chases us around. But my son is now like, mommy, it's, is it a moon day? My feelings are really alive today. Like he'll like know that. And so we create those practices. And I think that's how you slow down. You slow down by remembering that the relationship as a unit is just as important as the relationships that each of you are having with one another or separately by yourself in the world. I love that. And that's the moon ritual. I'd be curious to hear more about that. Recently, Mm -hmm. off and on, one of the things that I've tried to do with our little one, Sophia, six-year-old, is a little bit of meditation and breath work. And what I've found, we don't do it often, but like, you know, if her mom is out for a walk and it's just the two of us and a lot of things are going on, just to slow down and she used to like open her eyes more or giggle or, you know, all the little things, but she's starting to actually like soften into it and not resist and be like, no, I don't want to do it. Or, you know, open her eyes or squirm around, which is really nice to see that momentum. Do you have any tips, whether it's a moon ritual or people that are listening, parents that are listening yeah. uh, to get started, to bring more of these spiritual practices uh, to their children? Family. Yeah, this is a question I get asked a lot. There's a, a friend of mine locally. He's like, do a, do a thing for the parents of, about their kids and spirituality. I'm like, oh, parents want to know this, but maybe they do, right? I think so. Yeah. I mean, so we, we do as a ritual that seems really easy for children. And we do three things. We do energy clearing. So when you come in the house, we're like, have you picked up any energy from the day? You know, what's, what, what are you wearing today? And he's like, I don't know. Maybe I'm feeling worried. Maybe I'm feeling you know, a little bit too much, too much energy bars, we'll say, which is like high energy. So we clear the energy from the day, which is basically like you rub your body and you kind of like sweep off the energy from the day, or you take a crystal and you take a couple deep breaths and you blow all your energy into the crystal. And I think this is like such an important practice for like self-awareness of, of, of what you're, what you're holding in your current space and energy hygiene, right? Clearing and having boundaries. So we do that as a ritual, like I even have a huge copper ring that looks like a hula hoop and we ring each other where you step through it. So like that's part of something we do that's very spiritual. The second thing we do is the moon ritual, which full moon or new moon, we pull out a candle and we light a candle. And as at the dinner table, we pass the candle around and everybody says something that they want to bring in if it is a new moon or what they want to release if it is a full moon. And I spend, this is like a true story. I spend like 15 minutes like saying all the things And then my husband will say something very concrete and succinct. And my son will always say something like, I want to release rice. I don't want to eat rice anymore. You know, like for a while, it was like something very concrete. And we're all very different in that. And I think that's like also really cool. Like, okay, this is everybody's personality, right? Mommy's deep and all the things and everybody kind of someone's playful. And so so we, we do that. We do a little prayer as well. And not everybody does it. They're up running around, but me and you know, Brian and I will do it. And we do some sage for the moon ritual. And the kids love the sage. They love the singing bowls and the sage. And we do that only for a full moon. That's like a little more elaborate, but like I just share that because it's a super simple thing. Everybody eats a meal. Everyone's eating at some point. So you can, it's achievable. You know, sometimes it's more in depth than others in our family, but, but it's, it's good either way because it's anchoring in, like we connect to the universe around us. And this is something that I think all parents really need to hear is like, I find with, with children who are really anxious. There's a sense of fear of not not having safety or or not feeling secure in the world. And I find that spirituality offers that. Like my son has been anxious in the mass and I'll say, you know, we have a we have like a higher consciousness and your soul never dies. And like we're like your spirit guides are here for you. And if you ever feel scared, you can like take a few deep breaths or you can like ask for your higher self to protect you or you can hold your your crystal for safety. And I feel like spiritual practice offers interconnectedness for children who may grow up in a world that can seem really scary or overwhelming when they try new things, which they're doing all the time. I think adults don't do that anymore. We're not like riding bike for the first time or learning to read in front of a class for the first time. Like that stuff's scary. You know, we forget, we get into our ego, we get comfortable. So like little kids like get this experience of, 
of, of like what it's like to be in the world. And I think spiritual practice really helps with that. And the third thing that we do is we pull Oracle cards all the time. We put them on the dinner table. We pass it around a deck. Everybody pulls the cards for the day. We practice reading our third eye. So everyone says what their third eye says the card means like, and so it's just, again, like really normalizing spiritual practice and inner intuition and confidence is, is what we do. Can you speak to the Oracle cards more? about the third eye, because there's something that you said really fast there that I think it's important for the listeners to hear. It was about, and I'm just interpreting, I think this is what you were saying. You look at the picture and you guys talk about what it means before reading this description. That's what you said, right? Yes. So we say like, your heart knows best. I use that language. Your heart is connected to all things. You are part of me. I am part of you. We are part of the earth. We are part of all beings in all dimensions of time and space, even in outer space. So when you pull a card, it is really like you, your, your connection to all things and all things being connected to you. So you know what this card means. You just have to check in with yourself and hear the answer, right? I don't give that long speech now because they're like tired of that speech. They're kind of like they know that that's coming. And so what they do is we hold the card and you close your eyes. And you imagine what the message is. So we get lots of creative answers about what that means. And I just validate that. And it's really interesting because it has a projective element, right? Like he starts to talk, my son starts to talk about his day or maybe the energy that he needed to bring in, which we wouldn't have heard without that prompt because he may not have shared it otherwise. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And what I was getting to there is like, even with something as simple as seeing like 222 all the time and being like, oh, why am I seeing this? Or, you know, they someone sees an owl or whatever it is, and they go straight to Google. And there's a time and place for that, for sure. And I'm not someone who is immune to doing that as well. But I think is <laughs> sure. a great practice just to yes. slow down and feel into it. Then go into Rabbi Google, look for the, the answer that That's someone right. had out there, right? Yeah. I mean, it's ne- you're never too young and you're never too old to practice self-trust. Yes, exactly. Right? And that's how we build our intuition. That's right. That's right. And we are taught, I think, maybe not so much in today's society, like maybe the children, like when I was a child, everything is very concrete and very consequential, right? There was like path you follow, there are rules you follow, there's Our parents came from, you know, working parents. And if you want to make money, it looks like this. And, you know, so a lot of us were kind of born in that space where like, you don't check in with non-concrete intuition. At least, you know, that was not really the norm, you know, in in my childhood experience. But I think we're opening the door as the generations manifest to more of that. And I think a lot of us need to do, right, like humans that are like adults are learning that for the first time because they didn't practice that. Absolutely. Okay. So going back a little bit, I I have another question about how you're raising your son in terms of like other families and other kids. And how do you navigate that? Like, first off, is he homeschooled, public school, private school? Because that's important. Yeah. He goes to like a co-op, like a mini co-op, like private school. So it's a bit off, it's a bit off grid, but it's not um, like exclusively homeschool. And it's parents that are down with your way of life then, in other words, right? Well, it's, you know, I feel like I wish I could find, you know, like a super hippie school that just in in, in conservative, you know, Florida, where there's like a ton of willingness to connect to spiritual beliefs, but not like a lot of them are, some of them are quite religious, actually, some of the children that go there. So it's a mixed bag. This is a good question because I think the reality is our children are going to intermingle with, you know, as many, as many different people as possible. We chose that school just because there's a lot more creativity and attention Mm -hmm. to detail and like space to be creative. You know, no place is perfect. And I think any parent out there looking for the perfect school, they're not going to find it, you know? Absolutely. And the hard thing here is like, you don't want to shelter your kids. Like right now we're hearing about the huggy wuggy. I'm sure you know about that. And there's some other weird stuff like the huggy wuggy for, for those of you that aren't familiar with that. I think the general idea of this game is like they whisper, I'm going to hug you till you die or something. And then there's like a YouTube channel and it's pretty bad. And there's, there's a lot of things like that out there that kids are being exposed to or just, and 
we don't want to shelter the kids, right? But at the same Correct. time, like we want to foster the innate gnosis, you know, the wisdom that they're coming through into this yeah. earth realm with. Yeah. And so how, how do you navigate that? Yeah, I mean, right, like the diamond is forged in fire, right? We don't want to throw them to the wolves, but we want to experience diversity. So like, you know, we've had a few experiences in different places, like example, my son paints his nails. We've never really talked about any gender norms around that. And he has long hair. And there was an experience at a previous school where the teacher's like, well, boys don't really paint their nails. And he has a lot of about, he has a lot of like, like admiration for teachers, kind of other kids might say stuff and he kind of brushes it off and he came home and he's like, I want my nail polish off, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was a powerful parenting moment. You know, I said, we had this like powerful conversation and I was like, look, nobody knows what is best for your heart more than you. Nobody, not even mommy. Mommy's just guiding you. You chose me to guide you, but your heart knows best. Does your heart love nail polish? And he's like, yes. And I was like, then you, then you wear it if you're heartland. We will support you in that. And it would, and it was, he was four or five. It was, he was young. And, you know, and, and we, we had like a deep conversation about like happiness and how true happiness and deep for a four year old, like true happiness is doing the things that make you happy, that make, that you love. And if you love it, it's, it's right. If you love it, it's good, right? And I, we have this like thing, is it hurting other people? Is it hurting you? It's like, no, then it's good. So like, I, I mean, I, I see that time and space as like really fortifying for like his sense of validation. And that came from an experience where there was rejection or diversity. And I think it also helps us parents in, in the world. And I agree, we need to experience diversity. My goodness, this world, especially now, I think, is, is craving that. It's starving for that. We struggle holding space for people that have differing views. I mean, I'm really passionate about this idea. Like we have to be able to sit at the table with people that we completely disagree with and listen with an open heart. We won't be able to solve problems as a country, as a, as a world without that. So uh, we, we, we also got into trouble in another school because we don't, we, we celebrate multitude of holidays and we don't, we don't talk about Santa Claus, which is each parent's choice. It's up to them. And we got like some pushback from the other parents. They were like, well, how come you're not telling him about it? He's ruining it, it for our children. You know, he's exposing that there's no Santa Claus and ruining it for our children. So we had cool moments like that. And, you know, it was really easy for me to sort of parent from this place because I was like, you know what? Like, we do it differently than you. That's what I told the other parent. And I respect how you do it. And it sounds like it's uncomfortable for you how we do it. But this is how we're going to do it. Just kind of leave the space for discomfort. And then to my son, I said, you know, he's like, mommy, am I not supposed to tell people that there's no Santa Claus? And I said, well, you're allowed to believe whatever you, what we, what you want. And other children are going to believe what they want. And that's okay. That's okay for people to believe what they want. And maybe it's best for their mommy to be the one to talk to them about those beliefs. If someone asks you what yours are, you, you're always allowed to speak your truth. Right. But we respect everybody, which means we and he's like, what does respect mean? Right. And I'm like, well, it means we allow everybody space to speak what they believe. And and the more people who are different, the more beautiful the, the world is. I'm like, how many crayons in a crayon box, Kai? You see all the same colors in the box? He's like, no, there's red and blue and purple. I'm like, exactly. Like we need the world to be diverse and we have to exist in the in the crayon box together. So we practice allowing people to be where they are. But you have to know your truth. You have to know when to speak up. You have to know what feels good in your heart. You have to know when something's not right. You know, so we, we, we are like encouraging diversity while validating inner truth and confidence for what he believes. And he's got a ton of Libra energy. So that's hard to do, right? Loves social relationships, loves people pleasing. So we're working on it. Yeah. And I, I love that you brought in Santa Claus. One, because I'm Jewish and I grew up in an area with not many Jews around and I we didn't celebrate Christmas, so I can relate to that. But two, in terms of parenting right now, there was a situation where the six-year-old, our six-year-old told, told me that this other kid was telling her about, like, we drove by a cemetery. That's where all the zombies are. And we had this conversation in where she was learning about zombies and all this type of stuff. And that this other kid was saying and 
I was like, oh man, what do I do here? We're, I'm li <laughs> literally driving just her and I, and this is where I'm going to connect the dots with Santa Claus. I'm curious what you talk about in your family with Kai and uh, your daughter as well, when she gets a little bit older in terms of like unicorns, rainbows, and uh, not rainbows, unicorns, mermaids, you know, magical creatures, if they're real yeah. or not. Cause that was a situation with her where I was like, no, zombies are not real and had to have that. But I was like, I don't want this to shift to unicorns and her be like, wait, are unicorns not real? You know what I mean? Yeah. And then what are we doing here if we're telling them some things are real and some things yeah. aren't? So I'm curious what yeah. comes up for you. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to kind of lean in just like specifically in our house, we talk about zombies as being people who are attached to their screens. Oh, I like it. <laughs> so we're like, you're going to turn into a zombie if you watch another Jurassic World, you know, movie. And he's like, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not doing that. You know, so we kind of like, because we just define, we just define a zombie. A zombie is a person who's not really inhabiting their body, who's not really thinking for themselves, who's stuck, you mm -hmm. know? And so zombies can come in many forms, you know? So I think like that's the language we use and you can sidestep it however, you know, however people's preferences are, but that's how we use it in our house. Just kind of funny, funny enough. We do talk about mythical creatures and spirit guides as existing on various realms and allowing for that magic to have space in our lives. And you would know that it's right and true if you feel it in your heart and you feel a connection to those beings. And, you know, we haven't gone there yet, but there's, as you know, all kinds of realms with all kinds of beings from all dimensional spaces, both Fair. high frequency and low frequency. So it hasn't come up yet. We're like, hey, I'm scared. And are there other ones? And I think that's just because his nature, he's got like this warrior nature and he suppresses some of that stuff. So it doesn't come up as often as an overt fear of things. He's like, I'm fearless, mom. I have my spear, you know, we're like, mm. so like, I don't know that he, that's going to come up yet. May come up later, may come up with our daughter. And I think like the language that I would say around that, I've helped some parents who have very fear-based children or psychic children who are like worried about like darker frequencies and being mindful of like how they speak about you know, mermaids and fairies versus how they speak about zombies and, and, you know, like trolls is like, you know, when you embrace an energetic of love, there is no greater protection. And you don't have to worry about that energetic. If you focus on, you know, your relationship to love and your relationship to the spirit guides that protect you and sort of like using prayer or crystals or, or all the, all the tools, right. To be protected, just like you would find comfort in, in a, an oracle card or a crystal or a prayer or a hug from mom or warm soup, you would do that after having a bad day or feeling scared that a troll's out to get you. You know, I feel like this, the tools are the same. Yeah, totally. No, yeah. And you make a good point too, because I thought about that, that after I asked the question as well, like who's to say that these myth, mystical creatures and entities don't exist right and they reminds me of the movie onward and i always tell people like all yeah. you ever have to watch is the first five minutes of onward like and that's enough you know yeah we dressed up as onward a few halloweens ago it was good oh was nice really good. everybody in our family was one of the characters from onward so yeah i mean it's about your capacity to hold space for the magic and if you are like, like how wide can you hold space for that? And I think like it's important to teach children that we live in a diverse environment. We talk about hard stuff. We talk about like there's a war in Ukraine. We have a globe on our dinner table for the past week because he's like he's swirling through the grove. He's like, where is the bombs going off here? And who has the weather balloons? Like he's asking tough questions that I think are scary. And, you know, like you can't shield children. You have to prepare them and develop resiliency through holding them in spaces where they are scared and in pain. I think a lot of adults and the maladaptive behaviors they have are a result of experiencing pain or trauma and not being held and supported and saying like, like, I can't fix this for you. I don't know what's going to happen, but I love you and I'm here for you. And we're, we're in it together. I feel like that goes in it such a long way. And if we shield our children and take a arrow for them, they're going to go in the world and be not equipped to deal with life. Like we spoke openly about COVID. We spoke openly about our beliefs, you know, spiritually, politically, what matters in our family. Do you have any opinions about what, what you say about what matters? You know, like just continuing to create uncomfortable conversations as often as possible with a space permission 
permission to explore what you believe and to de- to define what you believe permission to define what you believe and not be told you have to believe this or we don't talk about death like we talk about death a lot in our family like your body will leave you know you'll leave your body and i'm going to leave mine someday and you, you know you'll have your own family and how do you feel about that and like just normalizing death which i think humans don't do enough of we resist transition and avoid death Whole another conversation, maybe another podcast on how humans avoid death. Sam, what do you think? I'm down. I'm laughing because a couple of days ago, my friend, your client friend, cast her husband, Tony, and his boys were here the other day. And he did podcast jokingly with his boys. And the whole thing was about death. And they brought it up, not him, like what happens <laughs> after we die. But yeah, I'm down. I'm I'm always down. Let's absolutely do this more often. We're, we are running out of time. Last question I have for you is yeah. I have a new tagline for this podcast. It's Ignite Magic Daily, meaning like Ignite the Synchronicities Daily. What would be your number one tip or first thing that comes up? for seekers to help them to ignite that magic on a daily basis? You know, this is something that came to mind today and it's super simple and that you can access everywhere is I love to sort of close my eyes and put my face in the sun. To go outside and to close my eyes and to just feel the heat on my face, even if it's cold out and you find the sun somewhere. And I feel like there's something powerful about like, a simple practice like connecting to the sun as a way to be like, you know what, we're we're connected to this like large system beyond this planet and we're like being given life and energy and power and purpose. And I find like when I'm in the sun, I feel like it's just like it's charging my batteries and I feel alive. I feel alive and present. And I feel like just taking a, a quiet moment to to do that. And it could just, it could also be like closing your eyes and listening for the birds or the wind right? Or the water that's behind your house, taking a moment and being like, yeah, like we live in a magical, powerful, like multi-dimensional world. And it's like awesome, harmonious way. And, you know, like, let's not miss that by walking out in the, to the world, focus on our own stuff and not realizing how interconnected and special we are to be a part of this here and now. So I think nature and for me, the sun, others, maybe other things is a great way to do that. No, that's beautiful. I resonate with that. Thank you, Candice, for sharing that. Thank you for being here, showing up as you're in your highest expression in your truth. I appreciate how you show up in the world and everything that you do. So thank you so much, guys. Make sure to connect with Candice if any of this resonates, which I'd be shocked if it doesn't resonate, especially if you're listening to the end. Check it out. Check her out on social media, Instagram, a lot of cool things. And Mighty or uh, your healing collective, the Rasa Healing Collective, is that still free to join? So the Rasa Healing Network is the is the over like the umbrella network, and that's always free. And I have free monthly predictions there. You can hop on anytime. It's usually the first week of each month and hear free predictions with the Akasha would have to say for the month ahead. And I pull cards. Then of course I have like courses and groups and a mastermind and a bunch of cool things happening in the network and a variety of different like price points. But the network is always free and the predictions are always free. Yeah, so join that if that calls to you. Absolutely free, like Candice said, a great community. Thank you so much, Candice. Let's do this again sooner. Yes, I agree. Thanks for having me, Sam. Appreciate it.